It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 111, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Rashid Nuri is the founder and CEO of Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture in Atlanta, Georgia. With four farm sites in Metro Atlanta, Truly Living Well is a leader in demonstrating urban agriculture as a sustainable solution for helping people to eat better and live better. Rashid shares his journey through the conventional agricultural system, including time spent working for Cargill and as a Clinton appointee to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, on his way to becoming an organic urban farmer. Along the way, he shares his insights into food systems and how Truly Living Well uses fresh food and crops to enrich lives and build communities. We also dig into the systems Rashid has developed for effective urban farming, whether he is growing in boxes on top of concrete or in the soil. Rashid also shares the simple but effective composting and fertility system Truly Living Well uses to create healthy crops that allow them to grow without the use of pesticides. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Farm Commons. Strong, resilient, sustainable farm businesses are built on a solid legal foundation. Farm Commons provides practical legal resources to help farmers understand and respond to how the law affects them. Free guides and tutorials available online at farmcommons.org. And by Farmers Web, making it simple for farms to work with wholesale buyers such as restaurants, retail stores, and schools. Farmers Web software streamlines your wholesale operations, making it easier to work with your buyers and with more buyers overall. FarmersWeb.com. And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. Rashid Nuri, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Uh, good afternoon, sir. A pleasure to be with you. So, You've got an absolutely fascinating history, and I want to get into that story, but I'd like to start with where you're at now. Can you kind of lay the groundwork for me for the Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture? Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture is located, headquartered here in uh, metropolitan Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, we're in our 12th season. We are 501c3. We use Food, we grow food, we grow people, we grow community. We use the food production as a platform on the plate on which we serve our programs because we are essentially a training and educational institution. We do seven sessions of summer camp. Uh, we have four food co-ops that we have started. We have six after school programs. And then we do our training and in, in, in we have a boot camp that we do. We have a women and children's program. We have a short term uh, urban grower training program, we have internships. So we are, are we have the largest urban footprint. I have several locations in the met four locations in the metropolitan area. And as I said, we grow food, we grow people, and we grow community. So when you say you've got four locations, about how much ground are you covering with that? Um let me see a, a big site downtown is six acres. We have two acres Two acres, that's 10, and none, about 12 to 14 acres altogether of land that's available to us. Now, all of it's not under cultivation, um, but that's our footprint, about 14 acres, 12 to 14 acres. Yeah, Atlanta is the greenest city in America by virtue of trees and open space. We have somewhere between 900,000 and a million acres that are free and available. And we calculated it would take uh, 25,000 acres to provide all the fruits and vegetables necessary to feed the people in the metropolitan area. So we're very lucky in that way. I had a friend take the train out from California um, to Atlanta, and she and her daughter. And when they came, they said, Atlanta is a great big forest with some houses dropped in it. So we're lucky in that regard. The, uh, we still have old growth forest around here in the city. Really? Yes, sir. So how, how have you found the land where you're farming? Most of it came to us. Um, the first site, we started in a backyard just south of the, sitting in Riverdale, just south of the airport. And it was really, it, it was, couldn't grow anything there. It was uh, under some trees. The second site uh, was referred to us um, by a colleague. Third site, uh, one of our partners in the business took out and showed it, uh, some land behind a house in East Point, which still remains as our, our headquarters. Uh, I, the, we needed to expand. It took me um, a couple of years to find the place we had. We had six acres down by the King Center, but that's been taken back to do development. 
And the folks that are doing the development showed me this land that's going to be now our permanent headquarters over on the west side of town. So they come through referrals and uh, uh, searching, looking, asking, and God has been good to us. How are you actually doing your production? You mentioned you got started in a backyard. Are you guys... Are you guys actually tilling up ground, growing in ground, or are you doing boxes on top of parking lots, or how? What does it actually look like? <laughs> Depends on what site it is. Until we had uh, got that first big site where we broke ground in 2010, we grew in the ground. All right, but the site we had um, on Auburn Avenue here in Atlanta, off of Auburn Avenue, was a, a site of a former housing project. And I like that site because it was in the shadow of the downtown skyscrapers. And part of what we wanted to do, what we have done, is demonstrate the efficacy of urban agriculture. So there we did both. We were in ground as well as in raised beds on the concrete pad. At first thought we said we'd take that concrete out, but I thought about it. I said, there's no reason we can't just use those foot pads from the houses and just grow right there. So we put raised beds on that and uh, grew food. Um, so now these days, when people are just, uh, particularly newcomers who are just starting to, to grow food in the urban areas, I highly recommend they use raised beds because then they're going up instead of going down, trying to dig down into this, this red clay, which is tough to work with. Um, folk can grow up that way, grow literally grow their food up on top of the ground um, instead of having to dig down and they have a better control of the weeds and, and uh, of the soil, um, and it works. It's efficient. Tell me a little bit more about how you're building those boxes and, and what you're putting into them. The boxes, the boxes I have now are made with cedar. I expect those to last 10 or 12 years. White, white wood, they only last uh, three to five years. And we just reinforce the boxes. Uh, on that concrete, I use two. Two by I, I use eight, eight uh, two by eight boards on top. So we got practically fifteen inches of uh, fifteen, fifteen and a half inches of space. That's how high they were, and uh, done the same thing on our new site with that I'm doing with the cedar. And then we grew in ground where we you know we just put the compost down and, and built soil. What's unique about our new site, Chris? Uh, we took one hundred and twenty-five fruit trees that were five years old roughly on average five years old one at a time we dug them up took them over to the new site and planted i moved 125 trees i thought i'd lose 10 or 15 percent but i only lost two trees so that was a real blessing and then we took all that dirt i spent five and a half years building that soil and we truckloads of soil that we took over to our new location i didn't want to, i invested so much time in that dirt i didn't want to lose it <laughs> sounds incredulous um, but th my emphasis in, in our training, particularly in the early years, was compost, compost, compost. That's how you grow food. You got to build the soil. And one of my favorite sayings is, I don't grow food. I, I build soil and let God grow the food. Like that. I've, I've had a few people on the show who have really emphasized that if you, you want to pay attention to everything else and the vegetables are going to take care of themselves. There you go. That's exactly right. And that, that's my attitude. So I, we, I, over these years we've been here, we've been, I have to say, we've been quite successful in convincing uh, the community how important composting is. Now you've got citywide composting activities and roundtables discussing how to scale up composting activities. And you're getting restauranters and restaurant tours and stores in uh, participating in this whole process. So that regard, we've been pretty successful. Tell me a little bit about that compost production, because I can't imagine that if you're doing that in the city, that's something that the neighbors get super excited about. Well, <laughs> you know, that's everybody's first assumption. But if you're doing it right, you're not, it's not going to create any smell. That's not a problem. I, I found out recently that our compost is vegan. And then that's not the language I've ever used for our compost making. <laughs> but we don't use any meat or any oil. In the, in the production of the compost. So at the very best, we'll, occasionally when we turn it, um, you'll get, uh, I call it the smell of money. Uh, 
you get some some smell, but it doesn't last very long, and it's, and it's not um, uh, people don't get upset by it. There's only one time in ten years that I've had anybody complain, and that was uh, uh, it was a bad wind day, and our people had not properly prepared the compost piles, and a couple of neighbors did get upset. Uh, they mentioned it to us, but outside of that, I've had no problem in all these years. What are you using for your feedstock for the compost? We pick up waste. Sweet Auburn Market is where we get a lot of our material. We get them from coffee shops. Um, a couple of store places make, we get the, you know, the, the um, coffee grounds. We get brewer's yeast. Um, from the Sweet Auburn Market, we get the, you know, just greens primarily uh, as a feedstock. Then we collect leaves from around the community during the leaf season. Every time a truck comes back to the farm, they'll bring some bags of leaves. So that paper will go into there, as well as the leaves that are in the bags. And then we also have a lot of wood chips. Right. We got lots of wood chips. Because remember, we got trees. I got, I got lots of trees down here. So we got lots of wood chips that are just delivered to us. The truckers, the tree companies are very happy to come see us and bring us their wood chips. Um, so they don't have to pay a, t- a tipping fee. So they save money and we get material. Great. And I know those, what, we've had a couple guests on the show who've talked about the importance of the, the Ramiel wood, those small wood chips. Like I can imagine a lot of the trimmings that you guys are getting as being very biologically active and a good feedstock for compost. Absolutely. So you just make sure you, you, know, you get a mixture of the green and the brown. Uh, keep it wet, aerate it, and you're good, you're good to go. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to make compost. You can take material, just put it over in the corner and wait a year. Uh, or you can be more active with it. Uh, for a while, we were putting plastic pipes, large, 8, 12-inch pipes, through our, with holes in it, through our stacks in order to aerate it. Um, but these days, we just turn it, and we, we, we use a bobcat to turn those piles. And that helps to speed up the decomposition and, and breaking it down into compost. But I also get uh, thousands of hours of volunteers. So over the years, I would just have the volunteers turn. And you, get a, you get 25, 50 volunteers out there on any particular day, give them some shovels and say, turn this over. So we, we, we turn it frequently, but right now we're using them. We do have a bobcat that we're using to uh, turn our stuff. Do you have any idea of what kind of tonnage of compost or how many yards of compost you guys are making on an annual basis? Oh, yeah. It, the number has gone up. Uh, Several hundred tons, several hundred tons, several hundred tons of it. We make a lot. So I use a lot. And then that provide. we got compost for the community, you know, that I, we sell it. We get a good price for our compost because it's, it's the best around. I like my compost. I call it black gold. It's just beautiful stuff. Um, so we use that. And, and occasionally, if I don't have enough, I will buy some. That's not too often. I got a man down the road that, that has a five acres of compost, and I've, we've helped him get his business uh, thriving over the years. We've introduced him to a whole lot of people. Compost, compost, compost. That's the secret to growing good quality, natural, organic food. Now, when you're doing the boxes on top of a concrete slab or on top of asphalt, are you growing the crops in straight compost, or are you adding other stuff into that soil mix? Generally, what I'll do is the first layer will be litter. I'll put some litter in there, uh, whether it's leaves and small, you know, clean up from around the site. Uh, then I'll get some other kind of soil put in there and top it off with, with compost. So it's three to five layers of material that we'll put into the garden. What kind of crops are you guys focused on? Do you, you grow for a CSA, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think we got 130 CSA members. Um, yeah, we grow whatever's in season. That's the other way. We're lucky. I can grow 52 weeks a year. And now we have uh, we have a hoop house that we put up. We got a 72 foot hoop house that we have up there. And a lot of growers, NRCS program, they're providing uh, hoop houses to farmers. So we've certainly been doing that here in the urban area. Uh, so I can grow all year round. And whatever is seasonal here, we have in. So from late August to now, through now, it's the cool season crops, root crops and greens. Uh, our last frost date is April 10th. Um, 
Um, but with the hoop house, we can get started earlier and, and last longer. I remember the second year that I was here, we had such beautiful weather in March, and I planted 240 tomato plants, and then we had a hard freeze on Good Friday, just before Easter, and, and uh, lost them all. So that was part of my learning process: be patient and uh, don't get ahead of the, don't get ahead of of what Mother Earth has for us. But we can grow. So you want know, specific crops? I mean, I got mentor. I have spinach and chard and kale and collards, um, radishes, uh, lettuce, many different kinds of lettuce that's out there. Uh, and come April, we'll have our tomato. We'll put our tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, squashes, okra. We can put it in a little later because that really needs to have some heat. We grow flowers for cutting. Uh, I love roses. Roses are the only unnatural hybrid tea roses are the only unnatural thing that I have in, in the garden. People don't understand how those beautiful roses that you give to your girlfriend, your wives, your husbands on, on uh, throughout the year, Mother's Day, are ra- actually highly unnatural. A true old rose most people would not recognize. Uh, I happened to, I, one point, one of my careers was managing a rose garden not too far from you. I was up in uh, Minnesota, and we had 30,000 rose bushes under glass out in Eden Prairie, just outside of uh, Minneapolis. So I love roses. So we grow them. I got gladiolas and lilies, and we do lots of sunflowers and all kind of cut flowers we have out there. So you've got the CSA, and, and now you're mentioning crops like flowers. Where else are you marketing your produce? We have a farmer's market. You know, years ago, I used to sell to the top restaurants in town. I don't do that anymore. That was a good place to start is we learn in the town and learn in the markets. Uh, but now most of our food goes in the stomachs of directly into the stomachs of consumers through our food co-ops as well as our CSA. And then we do four uh, farmers markets each week and that we sell our food there. Tell me about when you say food co-op, tell me about what that means. Cause that conjures up a particular image in my mind, but it's not usually something that's being run by a farm. Mm. Um, I have a, one of the, we have, remember, we're training in education. So we have some VISTA volunteers to help us to organize the uh, food co-ops. And one of the food co-ops, the neighborhood housing project, where the average income for the people there is $5,000. Hard to imagine these times, but that's what it was. So to get these people to sit down together and work to and purchase their food, and now they're running their own co-op. Uh, we did this in collaboration with the food bank. We get, we provide the green food, and and the food bank actually has some green food too. Uh, they got fruits, fruits, and they got fruit that they're able to give the folks. So they get to there, and I think that, that we, we give we provide nutrition classes, health classes, uh, as well as uh, fiscal training, helping people to figure, help them to to run their own business, run their own co-op, and it's been quite successful. We've been doing that for four years now. And that's a, that's a big part of your mission is getting food into communities where there isn't a lot of good food. Uh, yes, making it available, helping people to grow it themselves, creating food self-sufficiency, food sovereignty. Yes, that's what we do. Um, that's what we That's how I said we grow food, we grow people, and we grow community. You know, the food co-ops are part of the community. The training and education is the, uh, the, the tr- different training programs we had is growing the people. Um, many of the folks that work for True Living Well now came out of our training programs. Um, and then we grow, of course, we grow the food. That's the platform on which we do everything else. Now, when you talk about your training programs, are, have you had folks come out of the Truly Living Well Center and move on to run their own farming operations? Staying involved in agriculture, absolutely. In one form or another, uh, some go to work for other nonprofits. Um, several have, have started their own farms. Um, they, it's all different. You intern different places. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I think we calculated about eighty percent of our trainees stay in the business. That's really great. That's a great rate. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. I'll tell you the truth. I challenge that number, but that's what my people tell me it is. <laughs> you know, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that I tell all the folks all the time. There's two groups of people that tell lies. That's fishermen and farmers. And farmer, all you, farmers sitting around in the the feed store, seed store, how many bushels of yield they got on their crops, they never tell the truth. <laughs> so, uh, but it's fun. So, 
it's like a fisherman. That every time a fisherman tells a story about the size of the fish, fish keeps getting bigger and bigger. Right. That's why they call them fish stories. That's right. One of the things that we've seen be really popular up here up north with urban agriculture is, you know, these these programs doing lots of high tunnels, lots of high-end salad greens, yes. combining it with an aquaponics program. And we do have an aquaponics. I have uh, two, two, I got about 8,000 gallons okay. of uh, fish tanks. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I guess I should ask you, after you talked about fish stories, how big are the fish that you get out of there? <laughs> I'm more <laughs> I'm more interested in what grows above than in fish. The fish is just providing the, uh, the fertilizer for our plants. And I insist we don't do, I don't like hydroponics. I'm not interested in hydroponics where you're just putting chemicals into the water. What we're doing is really a um, uh, vermaponics because we have worms in the these clay, ba- clay ball base that we have, and we build a biomass that is able to feed the plants. So I... You, for every harvest of fish that you get, you can get five or six harvests of, of greens above it. I, the money, to be, in my experience down here, the money is made in the crops that you grow, not in the fish. Um, so we had, uh, before we moved sites, we had to break down our fish tanks. And we had a fish fry. Uh, had a lot of the people came in as a little fundraiser. Um, but our focus really isn't on the fish, it's on the food. I mean, I would imagine that growing in Georgia, you, you guys are organic farmers. Um, you must have a lot of disease and pest pressure with all of the heat and humidity that you have there. Why, why, let me ask, why do you think that would be true? Well, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, up here, we see the disease pressure really starts to kick in, you know, when you get into July and August, when things get hot and humid here in Wisconsin and, and the rest of the upper Midwest. Uh-huh. That's kind of the impression of what I think it's like most of the time there in Atlanta. Mm, no, not at all. You know, you figure we grow for abundance, number one, and I assume we're going to lose maybe 10% of my crop uh, to either to uh, uh, deer or rabbits. Um, and no, I can't say we have a lot. Of, I, I don't because the soil is strong. And the theory that I grow with is the soil is strong, the plants will be strong. If the plants are strong, it's going to make quality food to feed the people. Okay? Um, so that's my emphasis is on the soil. I want to have soil as a strong and as healthy, full of life. If you can't find the best way to, to, um, uh, to, to know the quality of the soil is how many earthworms that you have in there. If you don't have any earthworms, the soil is dead. Uh, you want roly polies and millipedes. You want to see that mycorrhizal fungi underneath your ground. That's why we don't, I'm not interested in, in running tractors through the ground because you're steering up all that life in there like you're putting it into a blender. So everything we do, all the work we can do, can be done with a hoe, a rake, and a shovel. And, you know, if I get some new ground someplace that I've never been before, I will run a, 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 a tiller or a tractor through that. But after that, all of our beds are semi-permanent. I don't want to disturb them too much. Now, that having been said, what we do is we grow compost, compost, compost. That soil is so strong. You pick it up, you can smell it. You put your hand down, you can put your hand down up past your wrist uh, because it's so open and, and, and porous. There's so much organic material in there, and you can see all the life that's running around in those beds. That's a good soil, and the diseases are not going to come in there. Disease in the field, just like uh, you go to Africa and see, everybody's probably seen some of those uh, uh adventure shows showing those big herds, the lions and the leopards and the cheetahs, they feed upon the old, the weak, and the, in, the weak and infirm, the old, and the young, old, and infirm. Uh, and that's how they keep the whole herd strong. And the same thing happens in the garden. You know, you keep that soil strong. Those plants are going to be strong, and they'll look out, look out for each other. Uh, they have a way of communicating under that soil. Uh, I know this is getting kind of spooky in here, but they do. They com- the land, the soil, will, uh, the plants are able to communicate with each other through that mycorrhizal network that exists in the soil. That's why the emphasis needs to be on the dirt, why the emphasis is on the compost. All of our soils, you come in our garden, look at they are alive. You can see the life that's in it, and we don't have a lot of disease pressure. Now, I, I will grant you that other parts of the state and other 
forms of agriculture, particularly the big boys, the commercial agriculture, they do. And they're out there with all those chemicals, but they kill every, all the life that's in the soil. They kill it with the fertilizers and the pesticides that kill and the herbicides that kills all the life in the soil. And that makes those plants that much more susceptible to the pressures that you were describing. Is it just the compost that you're using for that? Or are you guys adding other fertilizers as well or other soil amendments as well? Well, it depends on how you define soil amendments. I might put some, uh, I, I definitely use some lime every couple of years. Okay. And um, occasionally, like in the, in the potting mix, I'll put some alfalfa, alfalfa meal in there. Uh, so if I can find something that, that some other kind of organic materials, but not a lot, we primarily, primarily uh, use compost. I don't use any other chemicals in the, out there. Great. No chemical fertilizers. I love that. I love the, I love the simplicity of that. Yeah, no, that, that's it. It is simple. But I think that what the, the industry has attempted to make it has made it very complex um, by the introduction of all these, you know, the, the hybridization and the GMOs and all the pesticides, fertilizer, uh, pesticides and, and uh, chemical fertilizers that add up. They've added a complexity to it that is not necessary. And that's my attitude. Keep it simple. We try to emulate nature as much as possible. And you go out here, we got plenty of woods. And I point out to people, so just look out there in the woods. You got all those beautiful trees, old growth trees. You don't see anybody out there doing soil tests. There's nobody out there putting fertilizer on the ground, uh, putting other kind of chemicals. The trees grow, they drop the leaves, the leaves break down and feed the tree. So you get that circle of life, that wheel of health that is very natural, and that's what I want to emulate. You go out in the woods and kick over some leaves, and you see all that white stuff on the underneath the leaves, that's the mycorrhizae that you want. That's the breakdown. The soils in the woods are the humus that you're going to find in there. That's what you want to grow in. So if you, I tell my clients, people who, are, who we do installations for, um, look in your woods. Grab some of that dirt, and you can bring it in and inoculate your soil in your garden with some of the, 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 the humus um, that you're going to find out in the woods. So emulate nature. So you mentioned clients that you're doing installations for. Is, is that a large part of Truly Living Well's work? Mm, not at all. Uh, well, that's not at all. I, mean, it's, I, did a, I did a consultation today. We're going to do an installation for a lady. We did an installation for at a library uh, last week, week before. But over the years, not that much. When we first started, yeah, I was hustling. Anything I could do to earn a buck, I would do. Um, so I did put a lot of gardens in people's yards, several people's front yards that stimulated uh, – the whole community to, to get it, the whole neighborhoods to get involved with, with this agriculture thing. So I, I'm an urban agricultural advocate. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I've been involved in just about so many different areas of agriculture. I tell you, a lot of people have a greater depth of knowledge in any particular area. There are not as many that's had as broad an experience as I've had. So I'm lucky. I'm very lucky. I'd like you to talk about that that breadth of experience, because that was something that really struck me when I was, when I was researching you and, and getting ready for the show was like, you've kind of been everywhere and done everything. <laughs> well, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I'm a city boy. I call myself a city born country man. I planted my first garden in 1969 and, um, the, uh, didn't know anything about it. I can remember somebody told me how good corn is when, uh, you know, you, I, when you take it off the stalk and put it in the pot for a couple of minutes. I can remember the first harvest I had was, was, was sweet corn and not knowing that's really not any fishing crop for growing in the cities anyway, but boiled the water and ran in there. But the joke was one day I saw some corn silkworms in that stuff and I, my yard was just completely white. I don't know what I used to try to get rid of, whatever that was that was attacking that garden, and which was so far away from growing organically when I started, uh, but I didn't have enough sense to know any better and no one to teach me on that. But that's where I began. And then I, I went to, back to school, went to school. Um, I was looking for a practical skill. I'm a child of the 60s. 
we were talking uh, nation building in the black community, and we needed, in order to call yourself a nation, you got to feed, clothe, and shelter your people. So I was trying to decide if I wanted to be a carpenter to build, a printer for communication. And when I had what I call my burning bush experience, um, to make that long story short, God told me to learn everything about food from the seed to the table. I was interested in nutrition, health and nutrition. So I, I pursued that. So I went to graduate school in plant and soil science. My first job out of the university was doing what I'm doing now. And this was back in the early 70s. And I was working with children in the school. We started putting community gardens around. This was out in San Diego, San Diego County. Uh, and we built an urban farm. Um, it was a pretty large farm in the middle of town that was taken over by the city itself because um, they, for all the reasons they had. I had a job as an they called me an assistant county agent, assistant extension agent, because uh, they didn't. They thought, so they said to me that organic agriculture is not economically viable; it will never work. Um, a year later, I came back to that place after I left there, and they had where we had one garden when I started. They had sixty community gardens around the county. Um, I left that. I came down south for the first time, nineteen seventy-five. Um, I had I was responsible I was working with the Nation of Islam for the Nation of Islam, and I had thirteen thousand acres of land that I was responsible for. I had two farms in Alabama. One was four thousand acres, and the other was five. And then in Georgia, we had a forty-two hundred acre farm where I eventually lived. And on that farm, we had chickens, uh, sheep, uh, dairy, horses, beef cows. Um, we grew cotton, corn, peanuts as well as vegetables there. It was a tremendous learning experience. Um, and I, you know, I was young and dumb, way over my head in terms of uh, experience, but I, I learned so much. It was a grand opportunity that most people will never get. So here, you know, I lived underneath the two acres of, of pecans and had oak trees surrounding that. It was just an idyllic place to live. And because I was there, I never had to really teach my children about the birds and the bees because they could just watch the animals and they figured it out. <laughs> That's right. You know? And uh, from there, I went over to, to uh, Louisiana and I worked for the uh, Southern Cooperative Development Fund with Father McKnight. And uh, the, in the year that I was there, I started off as a, um, working with food co-ops, black food co-ops throughout the South, eight Southern states, helping them um, organize themselves, food cooperatives. These are farmers who were coming to grow their food. And I helped them set up their books and uh, give, gave them better ways to think about their business. They had a farm. They were trying to build a training farm um, Saint Land in St. Landry Parish, uh, just upside of, up by Opelousas, where Jim Bowie was from. And they had a man, they brought him in. He was working nine to five trying to build a farm. And, and it, all your farm listeners will know that that's absolutely impossible. Uh, so he, he got fired, and I took over. So we built a farm. We were growing cabbages and cucumbers, packing them out and selling, selling them locally. When I left there, that's when I came up north. And uh, let me see. I spent. Uh, I worked in a rose garden, and uh, we had thirty thousand rose bushes under glass up there in the Minneapolis area. And while I was there, I hooked up with Cargill. So I did 12 years with Cargill. I was first working in economic development, then not economic, in the analysis. Then I came back south uh, to Georgia for my second time living in Georgia. And I was up in Hall County, which is the chicken capital of the world. They had Hall County, Gainesville, Georgia. They had downtown and this town square. They got two monuments. One is a cannon facing north. Um, because these folk down here in Georgia are still concerned about the, the war of northern aggression. So they're still looking at it. they got the cannon facing north. They had a 30-foot marble obelisk with a bronze chicken sitting up on top. And I ran a soybean processing plant there for Cargill. We were crushing uh, 1,500 tons a day of soybeans. So I, I, I was the merchandising manager. I bought the beans, sold the meal. Sold the oil, handled the the uh, uh, the commod the trading in Chicago, the border trade. We did all of the hedging uh, on that, and that was a wonderful experience. From there, I, when I went to Cargill, I told him I wanted to go to Africa. 
um, but, but they wanted to find out how serious it was because I was 10 years older than my colleagues and took a large pay cut to come and work for them. I already had a whole house full of children. And from Gainesville, I went to Singapore, to Asia, and I worked in all the non-communist nations in Asia. Uh, that was a three-year ex uh, uh, ex uh, experience. And I did feed, seed, poultry. I, my title was regional investment manager. So I traveled to all these countries, everywhere from Japan and Philippines on the, on the east to uh, Pakistan on the, on the west. Uh, and everything in between, looking at the longest I stayed in Singapore in those three years was two and a half weeks. I had two passports and was traveling. I did, I, I introduced feed formulation on PCs. This was back when people had five and a half inch floppy disks. You know what that yep, is? I remember five you and a half inch. Yes, I am that old. <laughs> <laughs> Not as old as you, but I am, I am that old. So. Uh, yeah, there was a whole lot of people have never seen those things. Yeah. But I introduced it. We were using the MS-DOS back then. And the truth of the matter was I was just learning computers while at the same time trying to train people. We had five, five feed mills out there. No, we had more than that. But we had feed mills in Malaysia, in um, uh, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, um, Japan, Korea. Uh, so I was training the folks in all those areas and also did a quality control, and process and quality control uh, manual, operational manual for the whole region. That was uh, South Cargill, Southeast Asia. I always wanted to go to Africa, so I finally got over to, to go, and I wrote a, a book essentially on how to enter that market, and I did. I got to go implement it, uh, and we built the first carrying charge market in, in Nigeria, because uh, the farmers would used to sit on their trucks I mean, and sit at the feed mills and the flour mills waiting to sell it. But I started buying the grain up, company, up, up country, storing it, and making deliveries uh, in the future to the, to, the, to the buyers. And that had never happened before. It was also trading, trading uh, uh, maize, sorghum, uh, rubber, cocoa. I was the first person to, to uh, we were the first people to break the monopoly that on sugar import, lost my shirt. Uh, but since then, folks other than Aliyu Dangote are able to bring in sugar. So that was one. We had cotton gins. We had, we had purchased the British Cotton Growing Association many years before. Had certain co 13 cotton gins around the country. So I was on the board of directors of, of uh, that organization representing our interest in the, in the company. So I was there five years putting that business together, trained a lot of the young people, had a number of young people that were working for us there. Um, and for then, there I came back to the states and uh, spent another year over in St. Paul. Um, and then I then I got it went to came to Washington and I was in the first Clinton administration. I worked at the Department of Agriculture as the deputy administrator for management in the farm. I was there when the name was changed from ASCS Agricultural Stabilization and Conservation Service. We changed it to the Farm Service Agency. So I was responsible for, uh, for both the Farm Service Agency and the Foreign Agricultural Service. I was responsible for contracts, finance, budget, uh, IT, facilities. Um, I had an I had $18 billion budget and about 2,500 direct supports and you know, we supported 35,000 farmers around the country. For the, we had all the disaster payments and uh, all the payments, subsidy payments that went to the big, to the big people, Cargill, ConAgra, Continental, ADM. Uh, they would get these hundreds of million dollars in checks every year that was sent out to them. Uh, and that was under my responsibility, as well as all the disaster payments and subsidies conservation reserve programs and all that stuff. A lot of that has changed now, but at that time, all that was under, under my purview. I worked at the Commerce Department for a while, international development with Ron Brown. So I have the distinction of having worked for two African-American cabinet secretaries. Unfortunately, neither of them finished, got to finish. Mike Espy got caught up in some stuff. He was, he was eventually exonerated, um, but it was, wasn't pretty at the time. 
and then uh, Ron Brown got killed over in Croatia. Um, and I left the government, was doing some work with some small businesses around Washington, left and went out to California and got back involved with urban agriculture. was there for a couple of years. Uh, we had a number of projects and programs we did there, and then I went to Ghana um, in 2004 and spent a year and a half there. We went over to buy the Ghana Cotton Company. That deal did not work out. Um, I was there for a year and a half, and then I left there to come to Atlanta to do this work that I'm doing now. As I said, this is our 12th season here in Atlanta, and we, I think we are making a positive impact in this community. So that's a five-minute rundown on 40, almost 50 years of work. So what's really interesting to me, when you talk about that, that 50 years of work, a good 30-plus years of that work was doing very conventional agricultural things. I mean, not just from, a, from the standpoint of, working for conventional companies like Cargill or working in the government for the FSA, you know, that's a pretty, that's pretty conventionally oriented, but, but also large scale corporate style agriculture. And what you're doing now kind of turns that on its head. And I'm, I'm curious about how you got from, from there to here. Well, I had to suspend judgments quite a bit um, because I wanted to learn. I wanted, When I went to Cargill, I wanted to learn how food is moved around the world. Commodities are moved. Cargill does that better than anybody else. When I ran that soybean processing plant up in Gainesville, again, I had to suspend. There were certain judgments that I had to suspend. A lot of folks don't know how soybean, how soybean meal is made. You take the beans and you heat them up, you crush them, flake them, you flake them uh, to get the holes off, which is a product you can sell. Then you crush them, you run them through hexane. Hexane is the same fluid that is used at the dry cleaner to get oil out of your clothes. That's what they use to get the oil out of the soybean. Uh, then the oil is, the soybean meal is, is dried. The oil you send over to deodorizer to get that smell of that hexane out of it. And then you're able to put it in tank cars and, and send it off. So it's a... a that, that when you see how food is made on that level, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. Um, and uh, so I, I did. I had to suspend some judgments. I saw things that were happening there that I didn't approve of. I mean, I think one of the reasons they got me out of that economic development back in 1980, um, I don't know if you recall when, when the U.S. Boyc had boycotted the Olympics. I do remember that. Well, what happened in the feed business, I mean, in the, in the commodity business, those grain on the first business day in January of 1980, the whole slew of the agribusiness executives went to Washington because what Carter had said is you cannot sell anything to Russia. So they told the, they told the government, well, that's the problem because we have all this grain to deliver against the contracts that we have with the Russians and we can't do it. So what are we supposed to do with this American grain? So the government said, all right, I see your problem. So the, the, the government bought the grain from the grain companies. That was sale number one. Follow this now. That was sale number one. Then they told the government, well, what are you all going to do with this grain now? They said, we'll store it for you. So the government paid the same grain companies for whom they bought the grain to store it. They got paid twice. Then they went down to South America, other parts, primarily South America, and shipped the grain against the contracts that they had with the Russians. So they got paid the third time. The next step was the, grain, the price of grain, of course, dropped because the, the, the storage was so high. And the grain companies went to the government and said, well, what are you all going to do with this? So we'll tell you what we'll do. Now, the prices dropped. And we'll buy it back from you and let us worry about how to get rid of it. So they've got a, they bought it at a discount from the government, and they were able to resell it. So they got paid four times because um, of, the, of the boycott that, that Jimmy Carter had caused. And I'm sitting there looking at the wires, reading this stuff, and I saw that, and raised questions. What is this? How is this going on? And I asked a couple of questions too many. They didn't appreciate that too much. So uh, 
That's how those deals went down. So I saw a lot. I wanted to learn about this business. This is why I tell you there are a lot of people who have a greater depth of experience than I do, but not many is, have as broad. Part of the, before they would let me go overseas, I spent, uh, oh, I don't know, nine, six, nine months in a special training program where I went, I, I spent time in Kansas City at the feed mill. I was down in Florida looking at broilers. I was out in, up in Arkansas, Fayetteville, Arkansas, looking at Tyson's business as well as Cargill's business, feed business that they had up there. So I got to travel all over the U.S. looking at the different enterprises that Cargill had, and then they sent me overseas. That was part of the, the training. Um, so that was a unique program, but it prepared me for what I was going to see to a large degree. Um, and there's just more opportunity to be exposed and to learn. And that's been much of my life has been just exposure, just learning, having a chance to see things um, that um, others may not get a chance to see. It's been a nice ride. With that, Rashid, we're going to stop here, get a quick word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Rashid Nuri from Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture in Atlanta, Georgia. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Farm Commons. I had a great attorney while I was farming, but in a town surrounded by a sea of corn and soybeans, he often didn't understand the ins and the outs of what we were up to on a legal front. Whether it was dealing with intern housing, in-kind wages, land leases for my market farmer, putting my CSA on a strong legal footing. Farm Commons gets it. And what's more, Farm Commons turns that understanding into practical, accessible, and easy to understand resources to put the law into plain language without oversimplifying things. And did I say they were free? Free. Even my great attorney didn't do that. With an ever-growing selection of free guides, model documents, and video tutorials, Farm Commons understands that a strong, resilient farm business is built on a solid legal foundation. Visit the Farm Commons website or watch for their interactive workshops held around the country. Farmcommons.org. The podcast is also brought to you by Farmers Web, software for your farm. Farmers Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time and increasing the number of buyers your farm can work with overall. Use the software to inform your buyers about your farm, your product availability, delivery days, pickup locations, and more. With Farmers Web, your customers can place their orders online, or you can enter them for buyers who place their orders by text, phone, or email. You can define payment terms for different buyers, give select buyers special pricing, and generate pick lists, packing slips, and product catalogs for your customers. You can keep track of payments that you receive by check or COD, or buyer payments by credit card go right into your bank account. Farmers Web can even help you coordinate deliveries with neighboring farms. You can pause, cancel, or switch plan types from month to month at any time, even during the off-season. FarmersWeb.com. All right, and we're back with Rashid Nuri from the Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture in Atlanta, Georgia. Rashid, before we went on break, you were telling me about the, the history that you have in conventional agriculture. And one of the things you said is that some people have more depth of knowledge in, in particular areas of farming. But not many people have the, the breadth of experience that you do. What are some of the lessons that you learned in, in your experience with international and conventional agriculture that you brought and applied at Truly Living Well? <laughs> that's, that's a huge question. Um, he who controls your food controls you. That's a big lesson. Food self-sufficiency, food sovereignty is very important. There's more than enough. We, we have the American agriculture, particularly since uh, Earl Butt, has been based upon a Malthusian uh, paradigm that there's not enough food to feed people when it's not true. What happens is wherever you see people starving, it's because of politics. You got warlords who are controlling the food or the government is controlling food. When you, and like all the Arab Spring a few years ago was based upon food shortages in country. And it wasn't short because there was no food available. It was short because of the politics that surround it. And to see how that is handled, uh, the different forms and structures, lessons that I learned uh, of how, how the government is involved with, with agriculture production, the rules um, that they exchange, Right now, the big problem that you have, we have is that the U.S. technology is being exported, uh, introduction of GMOs, people like Monsanto and, and, and Bayer and all those big companies, Cargills, all of those folks are trying
trying to impose the an agriculture system like we have in the U.S. on the rest of the world. When the truth of the matter is the U.S. agricultural system is broken. It doesn't work. The, uh, I mean, the California has no water. You know, when we go to the farmer's market, sometimes you'll hear somebody complain, or why I have to pay so much for this food? But they don't understand our food cost this is the same as the food that you're going to get in, in, the, in the big chains. The difference is all that food in the store is subsidized. Those folks out in California, which is the richest agriculture producing region in the history of the world, okay, all of that food is subsidized. There is no water in California, and it's the taxpayers all over the country who are paying for that for the production of that food by subsidizing the water, bringing it down from Colorado, building all those canals that come over there, the bills that they've had over the over the last 75 years to support the import of water to California so they can grow that food. And that's the same kind of system that you're going to see all over. The cotton growers, if they had to, most of the commodity growers, if they had to buy their seed, buy, pay for their land, pay for the equipment, buy the seed and the inputs that they need, and then sell it at the market, they would go broke. Okay? But they don't have to because the government subsidizes the agriculture. That's why the U.S. Department of Agriculture is so big. Every time you buy a gallon of gas, you're supporting a corn farmer. Um, and uh, I, I hope I'm not stepping on the toes of your listeners. Um, but these are the truths. These are the things that I have learned as I, I've grown. You know, the ethanol, gasoline is 10% ethanol. It's all corn. Okay? Corn is used. We are a corn-based society. Corn is, you find corn is in the paper. Corn is in the clothes, the, tree, the starch that goes in to, to the manufacture of clothes. So we subsidize agriculture. We always had the Homestead Act of 1862 and the Land Grant Act of 1862 that were instituted by President Lincoln was developed to support agriculture. Homestead Act brought Europeans, that's how them folks got up there in Wisconsin and Iowa and, and Kansas and Minnesota and, and the Dakotas. They were just all the Swedes and the Norwegians were brought over to grow for they got free land, they got you know all the land grants, they had Subsidies got cheap money to be able to, to buy that land. And then the land grant colleges were set up to support the teach, to provide the extension services, the outreach activities, teaching people how to grow food in all those places. That's how American agriculture was built. Okay? The problem we have on the local level and the urban I mean the urban level is that folk will sometimes look at us and say, How come y'all are y'all self sufficient? Not tell them no, why should we be? Okay. So within my work, um, if you're gonna, if you want to grow food, make money, you there. I've got a number of, of folk who have small farms and making decent livings. Okay, we're a demonstration and training organization, so I need some help because all education and all agriculture is subsidized, so we do have to get subsidies. Uh, understanding how that works, the relationship that the government has to the people and the production companies and um, the, the the big commercial. I, I, you know, I got a chance to see that on so many different levels. So that's five minutes worth. So what you're talking about is what I might call a philosophical or an, an, an economic approach to thinking about and understanding agricultural systems. Were there things that you learned on the conventional and international side of things that you've applied when it comes to actually growing the food? No, I just learned how the rest of it's done and decided that's not what I wanted to do. I don't use any hybrids in my production. None. Okay. I think that, the, you know, never mind GMOs. I think if you look and see the rise of disease that happened since uh, Henry Wallace was the Secretary of Agriculture under Franklin Roosevelt, as Norman Borlaug sent him down to Mexico to start hybridizing wheat and corn, okay? uh, then the rice over there in the Philippines. And what's happened now is the human bodies, there's been a rise of disease within our society. Listen, here, here's a, and then when they add the, the GMOs in 96, it's just skyrocketed the kind of problem. Think about this now. In your up there where you are, how many people do you know that that are gluten free? They don't want to eat. They want getting food that's gluten free. Okay. And to me, that's patently absurd. Wheat has been around for tens of thousands of years. People have been eating wheat all that time. So how come in the last ten years, all of a sudden you can't consume wheat? Okay. That you have to get it gluten free which means you're getting paste. You're not getting, any, getting the real food. What is that? Because the, that wheat has all been hybridized. 
It all grows at the same level so they can get the machines out there and harvest it. And the human body has not evolved sufficiently to be able to metabolize that, that food. That is the reason you have all these problems. How can people have been eating wheat since time began? Any place you look, they had been eating bread. And all of a sudden now you can't eat bread. You can't eat wheat. It makes no sense to me. When you say you're not growing any hybrid vegetables, so everything you're doing is, is heirlooms and open pollinated crops. Absolutely, 100%. You know, we had a, I had a variety of broccoli that I grew for a number of years that I didn't, really, I didn't know. It was um, hybrid, beautiful stuff, standard, uniform, made big heads, a lot of, lot of side shoots. I was very happy and then I realized that it was not original seed. I, you know, it's hybrids. I had to stop doing it because I don't want to. I don't want people. I don't want to poison people that way. It's interesting because on my farm we leaned pretty heavily towards towards doing hybrid vegetables because you know we found. Mm-hmm. Well, I actually spent some time uh, managing the gardens at Seed Savers Exchange, and one of the things I always felt like and was that a lot of the hot the heirloom crops had they they were heirlooms for a reason. They they weren't particularly great, or they didn't do such a fantastic job of resisting disease or pests and and didn't necessarily produce great crops. Um, and I think about a crop like broccoli where, you know, I don't think there's, I've never seen an open pollinated broccoli that produced a really consistent crop. No, that's not consistent. It's not. And that, that's why it was hybridized, so you could have something that was consistent, but it's a antithetical to the human body. People can't eat it. They're getting sick. Look at the rise of obesity, how sick these, all our populations are, all these diseases, high blood pressure, all the heart attacks that folks have, they can't eat the food that's being presented from them. It's not good for them. So, yes, you, don't, you do not have, think about it this way. If you look out in nature, you will find, you don't find that homogeneous look on anything, whether it's people or tree. Every tree is different. You can have a stand of red oak trees in the yard, but not one, not one of those trees is going to look exactly the same as the other. You get a group of people and put them there. They, they, they may all be human beings. They can be all white, all black, but you know, the human genome uh, program shows that 99 plus percent of people are the same. Some of the skin colors and features will change, but you don't get two people that look exactly alike unless they're twins. Okay, so there's no reason to expect or anticipate that everything in the garden is going to look exactly the same. But that's what you're going to get with your hybrid. They're all the same. Everything. You're right. You've got a uniformity that you can depend upon. Uh, and disease resistance, I, that comes from the soil. If, you, if your soil is healthy, your plants are going to be healthy. I guarantee it. Guarantee it. So I'm curious how you deal with that variability from a management perspective. because. You know, as a, as a farmer, that was one of the things that was really appealing to me about a hybrid crop. And I think, you know, it's kind of a, I think it's probably appealing to most farmers about a hybrid crop. You know, you put it all in, all the broccoli comes together at the same time, you pull it all out. You're dealing with a lot of variability, both on the production side, but then I imagine in the appearance of the produce, when you're marketing that to people who you've said weren't necessarily eating a lot of vegetables, you know, aren't, you know, have you found that to be a challenge in your production and marketing? No, not at all. I can't. I don't have enough food. I can sell everything I got. So that's that's not my issue. Selling food is not my issue. My issue is having enough food to sell. Um, and that you know, if you humankind used to live within walking distance of where their food was produced, that doesn't exist anymore. We're averaging fifteen hundred miles in this country to have food travel to get to our plate. So in that situation, the commercial growers, they want something that's uniform. They want to be able to harvest it all at once so they can take it out of the field. But what I find is that I'm selling food directly to people. I don't need a whole field full of broccoli to harvest at one time to go dump. I want to be able to have it growing at different sizes. Even if I was growing in my yard, I wouldn't want all that broccoli to come in at the same time, exactly the same. What am I, What would I do with it? Okay, but so you get, since we're using broccoli as an example, there are varieties of broccoli that, that will stay out in the field. You not only can eat the head, you can eat the leaves. I sell the leaves on broccoli, broccoli greens. 
um, and they're very similar to collards and some of the, particularly the collards and some of the kale. And my people love them. They love them. We give them to them when they're tender. Uh, then we get the side shoots that come up. We're able to sell those side cute uh, side shoots and bring that to market also. So it's a little bit different than than the, the commercial agriculture. But I, I don't spend a lot of time railing against commercial agriculture. I, but I, I do have a tremendous number of supporters of what we're doing and the people that I've trained that it was an agriculture that works in urban areas. That's my specialty. That's my beat is the urban agriculture. So you would never hear me come berate you for growing the hybrids. I just share with you what I've learned and what I know. And if, if it can apply to what you're doing, then that's fine. If it doesn't, that, that's fine too. You're not going to get an argument out of me. We both, we're going to talk about, we're going to find ways and find the things on which we can agree and we can build and bond from that point. So tell me what you think are the keys to making an urban agriculture work. Compost, compost, compost. And it, it's interesting to me that, that when you talk about that, it's really about the soil, yes, not, about, not about the marketplace, about not the about the labor. It's all about the soil. All about the soil, right? Now, you got to do the work. Now, this work is no joke. Part of what our training programs do is, is, is separate the wheat from the chaff, those people who are going to stick with this business and who are not. People find out very quickly if they can handle this work, because the work is no joke. Farmers, farmer, a real farmer is going to work from can't see to can't see and still going to come home. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 69 years old, and I'm still putting in 14, 15 hours a day. I'm getting tired, but I'm putting it in because that's what's necessary to run this organization. Okay, I'm spending this time with you, and I still have to do all my paperwork. Man, I, I probably got 100 emails that I've gone through, plus the one, on, ones I already did. This is We're closing out last month's books. i got to go through the P&L and check it and make sure all those numbers are correct. I, I spend much of my time. I call my, you know, when I retire, which will be soon, uh, I ask them to get me one of those big fire chief battalions hats with the metal and the, and the long bib that goes off the back, the back. I spend so much of my time putting out fires every day. <laughs> so, uh, and I had a friend of mine, I'm complaining about having to put out fires. He said, well, you're doing a pretty good job, Rashid. I said, what are you talking about? He said, man, the house hasn't burned down, so you must be doing it okay. Right. So I said, yeah, you're right. So Rashid, the, the training program is a really important part of truly living well. Can you tell me more about I how that well. works? Well, we 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 a lot of ways we are plug and play. We can find a, a we can, if you tell me what your you know, whatever you, organization we're talking to, if you have a need, we can help address it. Um, we may want to talk about some of the techniques that I employ out in the field, but the training program, folks come in and they do they help us make they the, the longest one they spend a whole season with us six months, and then we send them on their way, so they will have a chance to plant cultivate, maintain, irrigate, harvest, make compost, um, do all and all the activities, bring you process the food before it goes to market. They have a chance to experience all everything that, that takes place in the farm. Now, I had one young man a few years ago who quit in the middle of it. He said, I'm not learning anything. We do the same thing every single day, and I'm not learning. You got, we just out here pulling weeds. I don't, I'm not learning. But which is absurd for a farmer because you know that every day you're in the field, you're going to see something new. You're going to learn something new. You get to watch those plants as they rise up out of the ground and come to fruition, make fruit, if it's a vegetable or, or, or um, uh, an ear, if it's corn or be soybeans. You get to see these, the, the processes and experience it. One of the huge lessons that one gets from agriculture is patience. Things are not going to happen any faster than they happen. Okay? Given a druther, I'd like to put a seed in today and be able to harvest it next week. But that's not the way it works. You're going to have to <laughs> learn patience. And that's one of the virtues and the values that you get from the garden. There are so many. Things take time. Uh, they don't happen overnight. There's a process involved. So that young man who's saying he didn't learn anything, he didn't go, he, he didn't submit himself to the work. He's trying to push it faster than it's going to go, and he got bored with it, and so he had to go. I said, no problem, son. If this is not 
your work for you, then you should go. But the folks that you have out there that are doing it every day know it takes time. Uh, and it's only going to happen in its own time. And that's a tremendous lesson. So are most of the people that you're training in, in your farmer training program, are those folks that are coming from the neighborhoods that you're working in? Oh, yeah. Um, for the most part, yes, sir. Um, but not, no, no, it depends on what the training program is. They can come, they'll come from a lot of different places. Um, what I was responding to, this new farm that we built over on the west side of Atlanta, all the work of construction, building those beds, filling up those beds was done by people who live in the neighborhood within two or three blocks of where we built the farm. So what that has done is, is given us a, created a relationship between us and them in the farm, at the farm, uh, and they welcome us to the community. I got on videotapes, people saying how much we, how we have changed their lives, um, how much love we've brought into the community through our work, the connection that we have in the community. Now, my, my, and that's the site, we call it the College Town Farm. I got an elementary school literally across the street. Those children come over for this part of their STEM, uh, STEAM is now called Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and M, what's M? It's uh, uh, mathematics. Yeah. And uh, the school across the street from us is the first STEM certified school in the Atlantic public school system. And, and they give us credit for a lot of, for helping them to get that certification. We just planted, we just put 65 fruit trees on the school grounds. Okay. We're welded there. We got a program, we got a boys club, a Y, uh, Atlanta Instructional Center, just up the street, Senior Citizens Housing. The AUC, the Atlanta University Complex Center, with Clark Morehouse, Morehouse Medicine, uh, Spelman, are all and uh, more uh, the International Theological Center, are all three, four blocks away from from a site. So we're getting those college students that are that are involved in our work. The Beltline is an economic; it's a corridor that's been built around the city. Uh, and we're just a few blocks from there. I got a church up the street. So all of these constituencies are right there in that neighborhood where it's called the crossroads. So we're able to reach out to all of those folks uh, to get them involved with our work. So that's how we, say we build community. That's the third leg. Food, people, and community is what we do through our work. So, and, and I have to admit, these days, uh, you know, there was a few. I, one of my cardinal rules of my life is never to ask anybody to do anything that I have not done or would not do. Okay, um, so that get in. You know, that means I, I got experience in this. I can now guide and direct people. And I, I tell them I'm flying at thirty thousand feet. I need people at at five thousand feet. I need people that are right there on the ground doing the work. So you know, as we've built our organization, um, unfortunately. I don't, I'm not out in the garden pushing wheelbarrows anymore. I really, you know, I'm too old to do that anyway. Uh, so I always think one of the, do it anymore. I always think one of the things that's really interesting as a, as a farm goes through the kind of growth that you're describing is how you delegate that, those responsibilities downwards and how you get other people to take on those responsibilities and still make sure that they're being done the way that they need to be done to get the results that you want to get. How have you gone about delegating that management work downwards as you've as you've moved into more of an executive role in the organization and 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 now you're talking about moving towards retirement yeah you know i once wondered what what does that mean to be retired and somebody told me retirement is when you can get up in the morning and do whatever you want to do and uh i realized i've been retired most of my life <laughs> i've been very very fortunate <laughs> uh, i've enjoyed all all the stuff that I've done. Um, but that succession is a really important thing. It's a huge question. And I've been addressing that with my board of directors, addressing it with the um, funders, foundations that I have worked with. And I got, a, I got several people now that the senior most love. I brought in a brother from North Carolina who's now the farms manager. And he and I are on the same page as far as growing techniques. I, I will admit, things are not quite at the same level as I, the, the level I would like or as it was when I was actually out there in the fields doing all the work. Well, it's changed. Um, I don't get in there because my hands are not directly on it, but we continue to grow. One point I had a man who was managing a farm. I had to beg him to manage it. 
Um, that wasn't his expertise. That wasn't his area. I had to beg him to do that. But his skill is his teaching. Okay, so he runs our training. Program. He's now the training director. And he's much happier because he doesn't have me riding his back every day. What about this and what about that? He's doing what it is that he knows how to do well, which is teach. And, you know, um, he's going both out and in, outside the organization, inside the organization. Uh, he's able to do that work. The man is, uh, we have a, on my admin side, I got a woman who's a, she handles our grant making. She has a title of uh, uh, CAO, Chief Administrative Officer, does all our HR and compliance work. She handles all that and supervises the education department. We have an education director who is, that's what she does. She directs all of our education programs. I got three or four people that are working in that area. The woman who runs our camp, God bless her. She's a wonderful woman, been my friend for many, many years, but she's not a manager. She's not an administrator, but she's absolutely brilliant when it comes to working with the children. Um, so you have to care. You got to get, you can't, number one, when people, when pe people will tell you who they are and you have to listen. So if someone says, I don't, I can't do that. or I'm not comfortable doing that. You need to listen to that and don't try to put a round peg in a square hole because it's just not going to fit. And you have to juggle, juggle till you find the right fit. And then the key is to get out of the way and let them run. Let them do what they know how to do. Um, so that, that comes a time, a lot of frustrations. And uh, um, finding somebody who will be the successor is, is, uh, is a tough one. It's something I'm wrestling with right now. Great. With that, Rashid, we're going to turn to our lightning round. First, we're going to get a quick word from a sponsor, and then we'll be right back. This lightning round and perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. In the wild, where our crop plants ancestors evolved their microbial partnerships, plants are provided with nutrients from the soil through the work of partner microbes in their employ. Wide-ranging roots reach an abundant supply of nutrients and microbes, even in less than ideal conditions. And now that you've gone and stuck that seed in a tiny little container, it has to get everything it needs right there in a few cubic centimeters of soil. By providing compost-based potting soils built on ingredients selected to create an environment that supports the growth of plants, chalk full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients, Vermont Compost ensures that your plants have what they need consistently. Makers of living media for organic growers since 1992. VermontCompost.com all right, Rashid, here's the lightning round. So what's your favorite tool on the farm? I like a diamond hole. This one is shaped like a triangle. So you can turn it on the side and scrape the top if you want to get weeds out, and you can also dig trenches with it. And do you use one of those? I've seen those in a couple of different sizes. You know, I've seen some of those that are made out of old sickle blades that are maybe two inches by two inches, and I've seen some that are quite a bit larger mm -hmm. than that. Which one, if you had to pick one, which would you prefer? Oh, let me see, about six inches. Okay. okay. Six inches. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite crop to grow? Greens. Now, I know that greens down south means something different than it all than necessarily does up north. When we say greens, typically we're talking <laughs> salad mix. When you say greens, what, what in particular are you looking at? Collards, kale, mustard, um, uh, chard, spinach, just green crops. That's what I, I like to eat. Uh, and, and lettuce. I, I don't know. I just, you know, it's interesting. A lot of the summer crops, I'm, I, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't particularly, I'm not particularly fond of peppers and eggplant and tomatoes. I would eat my tomatoes, our tomatoes, you know, again, they're a hybrid because those Cherokee, Cherokee reds and, um, some of those ugly tomatoes that just taste very wonderful. But in general, I'm not fond of tomatoes because they all taste like cardboard. They all taste the same. They're not. They don't have a lot of flavor to them. Um, but I like green. I like greens. I like to eat them. I like to grow them. Right. What are you going to be doing differently on the farm this year? Uh, less of the management. Turn it over to Maurice. Maurice has been here. He came last May. Uh, why he helped us to make the transition from the old farm to the new, and uh, now he's in charge, and he just che we check in with each other. I make sure my job now is to provide the resources, so if they need something, I got to make sure I got the money to pay for it. 
And that's really what my job is. And that's what's really different from the past where I was more hands-on. Now, you mentioned that you're working 14 and 15 hour days now. Can't see to can't see. What was the last purely recreational activity that you did? <laughs> I like, uh, I watch movies, I read books, I listen to music. Now you can stream just about any movie that you want. Um, my, my real enthusiasm in life are music and books. I got books in every room of my house. And uh, so I read and I listen to music. If, if there was one book about farming that you'd want everybody listening to the show to read, what would it be? The Soil and Health by Sir Albert Howard. Awesome. He wrote two, but he wrote one book back in the 40s called The Agricultural Testament. And then the, the war, that was back in the 40s. Then in the 19th, about the time Norman Borlaug got his, his Nobel Peace Prize, he published The Soil and Health. And where he made all the things that I'm telling you about the soil. And, uh, and that was my beginning of my knowledge of that. Sir Albert Howard, Soil and Health. And finally, Rashid, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? So this journey, this work you've chosen to do is no joke. There's no joke. Um, but, I, you know, I, I've done that. I'm at an age now. Uh, Chris, where I give myself permission to look back and 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 and, and uh, acknowledge the successes, acknowledge what I have accomplished over the years, and you know, and I look at the other sides of my life too. I, I had no idea when I was a young man that your body could wear out, you know, like a machine. And would I have done anything different had I understood that? Probably not. I've chosen a path and I'm stuck with it. So what I tell my young self, uh, I think I told myself then, you got it. The secret to success is getting up every day okay, and sticking to it and doing it. And that's 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 what I've done. Uh, I probably would have been a little less judgmental when I was younger. I would tell people, don't do what you're doing. So I don't do that anymore. If you ask me what I'm doing, I will tell you what I'm doing. I will tell you why I'm doing it. You're not going to see me on the street corner protesting Monsanto. I'm not going to do that. Okay? But what I am going to do is demonstrate how I could grow food and not have those pest pressures. And anybody who has listened to me and comes and sees what we do, they'll learn Monsanto will take care of their own problems. I want to grow people. And I can do that best by demonstration, doing the work. Rashid, thank you so much for being my guest on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Uh, it's been a great pleasure, Mr. Blanchard. And uh, if there's anything I can do to help you, please do not hesitate to call. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 111 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for NURI. That's N-U-R-I. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America, and by Growing for Market, where you can get 20% off your subscription with the code PODCAST at checkout. Use lowercase letters for that. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. And also, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show by going to farmer farmerpodcastcom slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer farmerpodcastcom I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.